this. I want you to notice something that the psalmist says, and we're going to pretty much say this. One, one day a, a priest was walking a man who was going to be executed during the days of hanging. A priest is walking with him and they're going up the stairs. The priest is mumbling whatever he had on his uh, written notes that they give you to, to say whatever you got to say when someone's going up the stairs of death. And he's saying a few things and as he's saying a few things the man stopped and he looked at the priest and he said stop right there and the priest stopped and the man yelled at him he says what are you mumbling about? What are you saying? And the guy said well I'm just reading you know the oath and the death bill, whatever that they gave them, and he goes like this, don't you care for me? Don't you care what's going to happen to me? And the priest knew not what to say, so they grabbed the man, kept walking him, the priest kept walking behind him, mumbling the words. Now I want you to notice what's it said here in chapter 142, if you're there, Psalms 142, and I'm going to read you one verse here, and I want you to consider what I did, the story that I just told you. And I want you to see something here. The Bible says in verse, <coughs> the Bible says here in this verse, it says, I, this I'll stand by the way, I'm sorry. This I'll stand. In this one verse, the Bible says this, I looked on my right hand and beheld, and there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. And what's the last thing? No man cared for my soul. No man cared for my soul. Let's pray. Father, as we come in prayer, our Father, we ask today that you would just be with us, Father, and help me to preach, dear Lord. Our Father, in a way that people would understand that we ought to care for people's souls. Help us to understand that we ought to be better soul winners. But Lord, maybe there's someone here, Lord, and perhaps they, there are Christians here that say to themselves, no one cares for me, God cares. May they understand that. And Father, may we start caring for others. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Amen. I'm going to just give you a thought here. I want you to realize that he asked a, a, he asked a question. He said, no man cares for my soul. We were talking one day. I was driving down, uh, down to go to the bank. Uh, and, and as I, I was driving down to the bank, I hear the news, Michael Jackson died. I said, oh, wow. Now, so did Farrah Fawcett the same day. How many of you know Farrah Fawcett? Two, okay, <laughs> three. <laughs> Understand. So I get to the bank and I walk in and somebody was talking about something and I said, yeah, I, said, I just heard on the news that uh, Farrah Fawcett died. The guy goes, oh, Farrah Fawcett died, huh? And I said, yeah. And I said, they said also Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, he went bananas. He died, I said, wait a minute, Farrah Fawcett died. But all you cared about was Michael Jackson. Nobody cared that she died. The truth is, people, and oh, by the way, another guy was standing behind us. He goes like this. Michael Jackson died. Who cares? And I thought to myself, God cares. I mean, I didn't like Michael Jackson. And I'm not going to get into it, but I'm just simply saying, God cares. That's right. Amen. I don't care who it is that died, God cares. Amen. It might be the worst guy in the world. God cares. Might be the meanest person in the world, and you and I might say they deserve that, yeah, but God cares. We have to remember that that's still somebody's child. Amen. There's a mom, let's, let's use a, some guy that's a very vicious killer, kills a lot of people. Some there, some, somewhere, there's a mom or a dad or a brother or sister that loved that person. That's right. And there's a God in heaven that cares. Now, right. as we start on this, I, I want you to remember because a, a, a guy, there was an old drunk. And I'll get to my message in a minute. <clears throat> there was an old drunk around town that nobody paid attention to. Nobody witnessed to him. They never invited him to revivals. All of a sudden, that old drunk died. He was driving his car. His car fell into a lake, and he drowned. They found out what had happened. They said, well, I'm sure that he's down there. We're going to have to get him. And they started spending uh, money now in those days to us it would be it wouldn't be a lot today but in those days it was a lot back in the 30s it was a lot of money they hired someone to dive and see if they could find the body uh, so they hired a guy they paid 40 something dollars I think 49 dollars for someone to dive down there and find the body 
All the people were gathered around, seeing if they were ever going to bring him up, and they didn't bring him up. When they brought him up, of course, they take him to the funeral. Uh, they, they gave money to the, to the wife so that they could bury that old drunk, and they got him buried. And the pastor, before he preached the funeral, he stood up, he goes, you know, it's funny. When Mr. So-and-so was alive, we didn't spend one dime to go see him at his home. And now that he's dead, 40 something dollars to pull him out dead out of the water. Ain't that the truth? Mm -hmm. Not Amen. one dime when he was alive to go by and share the gospel with him. And now that he's dead, we go all out. Ain't that a little backwards? Mm -hmm. we should, they should have gone all out before he died. Amen. Not after he now he doesn't need them now, he's gone. Regardless of what you do with his body, he's gone. If the fish ate his body, he's gone. His soul is what was important to God. Let's start here, if you would. Who cares if a soul goes to hell? Listen, let's use that one thought this morning. Uh, he said, no man cared for my soul. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, or you're here this morning and you're down and out, let me say to you that maybe people around you don't care, but God cares what happens to you. Amen. God is concerned about your soul. That's right. Amen. Uh, uh, that's why in the church we cannot turn anybody down. Why? Because God is concerned for them. God cares about them. That's right. Now let me give you a thought as we start here. If you were to ask yourself, Pastor, who cares for my soul? Go to 2 Timothy and I'll show you what I'm talking about. 2 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> Pastor, who cares for my soul? I believe I can truly say to you, and I believe with all my heart, that God cares for your soul. Amen. Let's use God first of all. God cares for our soul. Someone, uh, as a matter of fact, I want you to notice here. See, God has done something for mankind that mankind needs to understand. God speaks to your heart. Because he is God, God tries to get your attention somehow. God tries to get a hold of you somehow. God tries to tell you, hey, listen up. Uh, you're in danger. You couldn't die and go to hell. You need to get your heart right with God. And God tries to get our attention. Notice what happens here in verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, the Bible says. Now notice what it says. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That means, that means God deals with every single living human being. Nobody will die and go to hell without God dealing with your heart. Somewhere, somehow, God's going to try to get your attention. God's going to try to let you know you need salvation. God's going to try to let you know you need to get right. Then he goes on to say, uh, For the grace of God that brings salvation... Has, a, excuse me, has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's assume this Bible is the grace of God. Remember, God's grace is when God gives you something you don't deserve. Amen. When God offers you something you don't deserve. So let's say this Bible is a word, is, a, is, is this, this Bible here is God's grace. Somewhere, somehow, God is going to uh, uh, show you His grace. He's going to try to hand you His grace. And the only way that that grace is any good is if I have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Because you're saved by grace. And what else? Faith. Without faith, you're not going to get saved. Well, God was gracious, just saved me. No. God's going to save you when faith kicks in. Amen? And when faith kicks in, I'm going to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. What does grace do, though? It begins to teach you. Uh, why do you think that as a sinner you get convicted? God didn't come to call the righteous to repentance. The righteous are already righteous. Amen. He came to call sinners to repent. Amen. What do sinners repent of? Amen. So the grace of God begins to knock at you and say, Hey, listen, you better get your life together. Before I knew, now how can I explain this to you? Before I knew the Bible... Somebody just shared the gospel with me, how Jesus had died, he rose again, and that's about all they told me. They really didn't get deep into it, but they told me that. Well, how did I naturally know that I had to ask God's forgiveness and get my life straightened out and give my life to Jesus? How did I know that I had to trust Christ as my Savior? How did I know that? Well, I understand, I could be anywhere, I could, back in the day, I'm 22 years old, I'm cruising around with friends, Everywhere I was, God would convict my heart. God would say to me, you don't need to be here. You need to get out. You need to be saved. You're going to go to hell. You need to be saved. No matter what, I mean, I could be drinking and a guy would come to me and he would open the Bible and say, look, 
Here's what the Bible says about, about salvation. And, and one day a guy read, just read a, a verse to me. He said, look at this. It says here, no drunk shall inherit the kingdom of God. Well, I was part of that team. <laughs> Amen. I was. And I thought, you know what? I said, I don't believe that junk. But I said, by the way, how do you even know that's the Bible? You know, I mean, that's the way I was. I didn't care about stuff like that. He walked away. And as soon as I began to walk away, there was a conviction. A conviction in my soul saying, you're not going to go to heaven. It was terrible. Amen. God was convicting me. I, I probably shouldn't. Well, I'm not going to share it because Ronnie will get mad at me. I was going to share something how, how wicked she was. No, I'm kidding. I was going to share another, another thought, but I want to leave it alone. But can I give you this real quickly? Understand, the Bible says that when God forgives our sins, he cast those sins in the midst of the ocean. Micah, what is it, 719? He cast those sins in the midst of the ocean. One day a guy's going on, on the ocean and he sees the, the uh, he, said, he said, he points out here, in this area out here is where the Titanic sank. And some guy said, boy, I can't wait till they bring that thing out so we can see. He said, they're not going to bring that out. It's too deep for anybody to bring that thing up. He said, then I thought about my sin. My sin is down there somewhere too deep for anybody to bring it out. Amen? Right. I mean, God forgave your sin. Leave it alone. Amen. Live Amen. right with the Lord. Enjoy, the, enjoy your Christian life with the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I'm just simply saying here that we have to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just simply saying here that we need to understand that God loved us so much that through his grace he began to deal with you so that you would understand you needed salvation. That's right. You needed to be born again. You're not born again, you're not going to go to heaven. So God deals with us. So God cares for our soul. He cared for, excuse me, he cared for our soul so much that one day he sent his only begotten son. And by the way, he sent them by means of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Not only that, the angels announced his arrival. Can I say to you that he was wrapped in love, amen? When he brought the Lord into the world, for God so loved the world, he was wrapped in love. Amen. He gave us the best gift that he could have gave. He gave us the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, the angels watched him. Could you imagine the angels looking down, watching the Son of Man, watching Jesus Christ, God himself in human form, die in the cross, and they're looking at him and wondering what in the world's going on to see the creator of the universe. On a cross. Consider with me then that all of a sudden, as I heard one preacher tell the story once, he said, Do you know what happened on that particular day? Jesus is on the cross and he cries out, It is finished. The sacrifice has been accepted. You, if, you've ever, if you've ever read the story of Jerusalem and how they, the priest used to do that. Now understand, this is, this is very, very important. What I'm going to share with you is very important. The priests would be, uh, would, they, would be, they would be offering the sacrifices. When Jesus was being crucified, the sacrifices were being offered at the temple. Yeah, together. So if we, we could see that little hill up there. Uh, Jesus would be at the hill up there, and we would, be, we would be offering the sacrifices. The priest would take the sacrifice, and he would come into the, uh, come in here and offer it up before the Ark of the Covenant. And, of course, uh, after he had offered up the sacrifice, he would say one thing. The trumpet would blow. You know what he would say? It is finished. The one dying on the cross was our high priest. Right. Amen. And he said, it is finished at the same time. Amen. And when he said it, though, the veil of the temple tore in half. Amen. Tore in twine. No more sacrifices. God had accepted. That's what that meant. God had accepted the final sacrifice. Amen. Now, Jesus had one more thing to do before salvation was complete, just in case you didn't understand that. He had to raise from the dead. Amen. Without Amen. a resurrection, you got no salvation. Amen. He said, it is finished. What happened? Jesus, uh, the sacrifice, the blood, everything Christ offered up at the cross had been taken. And, and one preacher said, you know, on that particular day when he did that, you could see the drop of blood go down into a blade of grass. Just drops, hits that blade of grass, and here it is. He goes, a, a little, a, a little grasshopper is out in the blade, blade of grass, and he takes off saying, I don't know what this guy means, but he said, it is finished. Seems pretty important to me. He goes over to the, to the, to the flowers, and the, there's a little bee at the flower. He said, man, I don't know what he meant, but he said, it is finished. And it seems pretty important to me. And that little bee takes off flying and goes up, and, and there's a bird flying by. And he, and he says to the bird, man, I'm not sure what he's talking about, but he said, it is finished. 
So the bird goes to flying, and, and he meets an angel, and he says to the angel, hey, uh, uh, that, that, that guy on the cross, uh, you know, he, he seems like he's the, the creator, and he said it is finished. And the angel says, I don't understand. Remember, angels didn't understand what was going on. He was the king of kings. They'd never been redeemed. So the angel says, goes up, and he says to Michael, hey, I'm not sure what's going on down there, but he said it's finished. And he walks over, all of a sudden Michael gets his band of angels, of course, because he's the leader of the, of the, the angels, and, and he's the leader of the army up there. That's what I call them. I'm not sure exactly what they are. But they get to, to walking before the throne. You could imagine walking up to the throne on those streets of gold, and you could hear the click clack of the, of the, of the, of the, excuse me, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the shoes that the angels wear. You could hear the click clack as they walk up before the throne and the father says, what's going on? He says, uh, we don't understand, but he said, it is finished. Now I know that Jesus doesn't cry, or excuse me, God doesn't cry or use a handkerchief, so I'm just making it up, just so you'll know. <laughs> he takes his spiritual handkerchief and wipes his eyes. He says, praise the Lord, my son. It's coming home. Amen? Amen? And all of a sudden, the angels get to worshiping and enjoying and having a great time saying, the Son is coming home. How important are you to God? Important enough that He gave you His only begotten Son right. to be sacrificed and killed on the cross so that you and I, by trusting Him as Savior, can go on to heaven. Amen? Amen. I'm simply saying, that's what the Lord did for us. When we think about the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no better, there's no, excuse me, there is no better uh, thing that God could have done for us than that. Let, let me illustrate for you to get a little closer home. I'll never forget the story that brother, uh, forget his name, so I, I'll tell you his name if I remember in the middle of the illustration. But there's a, a preacher that uh, I had to go see. He's a free will Baptist preacher up in uh, uh, Kentucky somewhere. And uh, he was preaching one day. And he made the statement, he said, you know, he said, uh, up in a certain area, he said, there was a little boy killed. He said, now that's during the time when they had wagons. And there were those, those like, like San Francisco has those rail cars that go on the, on the tracks. He said, they had those track cars out there, he said, half train, whatever. He said, the little boy walked into a, a, a flower shop. He said, today's my mother's birthday. And my I got to buy her, I got to buy her a flower. The man said, okay, he said, uh, you can buy these here. There's so much money. He says, I, I don't have that much money. He said, well, how much you got? So he named his price. Of course, back in the 40s, whatever, that was a lot of money. But he named, he, well, I got so, much, so many pennies or whatever. The guy said, son, that ain't going to get you very much. I'll tell you what. He goes, so he got the best rose he could find. He took the rose. He said, and not only that, I'm going to give you a paper. He got this paper, wrapped it up real pretty. And he gave it to the little boy. And the little boy got excited. And he said, I'm going to give you this uh, for those two pennies you got there. And the little boy gave the pennies. And he said, uh, actually, the guy was going to give it to him. And he said, no, sir, I got I to gotta buy it. I want to tell my mom I bought this for her. So he gets it, walks out. When he walks out, he gets to the, he gets to the, to the street. But he's so excited, he didn't see the rail coming. And he ran them over. Cut his legs off. The little boy's laying there dying, and all he could think of is, I gotta get these flowers to my mother. When they were trying to help him, he told the medical guy who was trying to help him, he said, no, I, I gotta get these to my mother. I gotta get these to my mother. Another man standing there said, I, I, know, where, I know where you live, we'll, we'll take them to your mother. And the little boy passed away. The mom was blind, they were poor. He stole newspapers to try to get her a flower. When they got there, the guy said, uh, ma'am, they tried to tell her what happened. She goes, I is he okay? He said, well, no, ma'am. He, he passed away. She cried for a little while. Then they said, ma'am, but because it was your birthday, he wanted to give you this. So they gave her the flower, and she said, is it a pretty flower? He said, this is very pretty. She said, does it have a pretty wrapping? And the guy said, it's got the most beautiful wrapping I've ever seen. It's wrapped in love. Yeah. You know that when God gave us his son, he wrapped him in love. Amen. Right. 
He wrapped him in there. He couldn't have gave you anything. No, God cares if you go to what happens to you. Amen. God cares for your soul. God cares if you're going to live or die. God cares if you're going to hell or to heaven. Christ, uh, Christ loved us enough that he died for us. I, I, I got a lot on this one, but I'm not going to go through it. Let me say this to you. Uh, Christ cares what, uh, what happens to you. Amen. No man cares for my soul. No, but God does. And Jesus cared for you. Amen. He cared for you enough that he came to the cross and that he died on the cross so that you would not have uh, to go to hell. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to hurry on this one, but I want to say this to you. The Holy Spirit cares. Amen. Did you know that the Holy Spirit cares enough that he deals with our hearts even before we're saved? That's right. He convicts us. He comes at us and, and stays on us and stays on us. The Holy Spirit is coming into the world to do what? Convict the world of sin. Amen. Righteousness and, and of judgment to come, the Bible said. The Holy Spirit is going to convict you. Right. Sometimes you come to church, even some of you that are already saved, you come to church and you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And you say, oh, that pastor's just after me. No, it's the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit's trying to tell you something. Amen? Mm -hmm. And I wish sometimes we would listen to that Holy Spirit. Because the only thing the Holy Spirit wants to do is guide you back into the Scripture. Amen. What does God have to say about it? Boy, we don't want to know what, sometimes we don't want to know what God has to say about it. But I, I'm going to say this to you. The first thing He wants to do, He wants to guide you to salvation. That's right. We want to make sure that you understand the gospel. He's the one that opens your eyes and gives you wisdom. He's the one that convicts us of our sins so that we'll understand that we're no good. It's the Holy Spirit that does that. Amen. And then all of a sudden, not only the Holy Spirit uh, convicts us of that, once we get saved, He becomes our comforter. He becomes our guide. Amen? And He teaches us all truth. Why does He do that? Because He loves us. Amen. Kind of like you take your kids and you try to teach them when they're going to school and you try to help them when they come home. You're tired, but yet at the same time you get, the, uh, you get to trying to help them to, to write their name or learn their ABCs. Why are you doing that? Because you love them. Amen. And because you know the future and you want something better for them. Amen. I understand God knows what's ahead of us. That's right. Sometimes we look up and we dread it. <laughs> Amen. Uh, times have changed since I was young. Times have changed since some of you were young too. Amen. Consider with me for a minute. If you, if I, I, who did I tell the other day? I read something the other day that said this. I thought getting old was going to take longer. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. The truth is it goes by so fast. Mm -hmm. But then I want you to consider that as we look at life, uh, if I go back to, uh, how you sister be? I won't pick on this one. Life was different for her when she was in her teens. <laughs> Life was different. The whole thing was, the world was different. Amen? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, all these changes come around. She went from doing the swim and the fish and all that. She used to dance in her day. <laughs> I'm just kidding you, Sister D. The swim, the, the, the fish, you ever see her do the fish? She's pretty good at it. But anyway, but she moved a little bit to where she's at now. And if she looks back at her life, she goes, man, things have changed. Amen. I was telling, I think it was Rebecca. I think it was me and Becky were talking about when they first got their first cell phones. Mm -hmm. Remember when cell phones were more available? Becky got her first cell phone. I said, they borrowed and I called call Paul. Paul was in the car ahead of us. And she goes, you're wasting my minutes. You remember that? Yeah. You're wasting my minutes. I got to pay by the minute or something like that. You're wasting my minute. Now, of course, you don't even worry about the minute, but he used to do that. That's right. <laughs> Amen. There was no texting. There was none of that. When I grew up, they had that little phone, and you used that thing, and sometimes someone would say, get off the line. I'm talking to someone. There was you know, what are party lines. Party lines. Everybody had Amen. Or well, they listened in, one or the other. It's just all kinds of great. But life has changed, has it? You see, here's what I'm trying to say. As life changed, the Holy Spirit helps you to change with it. Amen. As life, as life gets rough, you say, oh, but life's getting a little bit rough. The Holy Spirit will help you to change with it. You, I used to wonder, what's going to happen when the kids get older? But I, the Holy Spirit has helped me to adapt and to try to figure out, okay, you got to pray now this way, now you got to pray that way. Now you, The Holy Spirit teaches you that. But God put the Holy Spirit inside of you the day you were saved so that the Holy Spirit can help you grow. You know why? Because God cares for you. Amen? And he sent the Holy Spirit. He gave us his son. Not only the Holy Spirit, not only the Holy Spirit, but can I say to you, if, if you want to just consider this for a minute, people in hell care about you. Somebody in hell cares about you. Did right. you know that? 
The man in hell, Luke chapter 16, he did, here's what he does. He said, he said, here's what he does. He says, send someone to my father's house. Someone cared for them. Mm -hmm. The guy in hell cared for them. Amen? Mm -hmm. I used to think a lot, and I still do sometimes, when I witness to my brothers and sisters and try to get them saved, I sometimes think like this. I think, you know, I wonder if my mom uh, and my dad say to me, witness to them. Get them saved. Don't let them die lost. Get them saved. I wonder if they think that way. Amen? Think about it. Someone you love died and went to hell. I, I, I won this two girls to the Lord one day, and uh, there were young ladies, and they said to me, my dad just passed away about a month ago, and they got to talking about their dad, and, and I don't know where their dad is. I didn't know him. So I said, ma'am, I said, I, I don't know where your dad is. I said, I, I can honestly be honest with you. I don't know where he's at. I don't know if he was a Christian or if he wasn't a Christian. They said, well, we don't know. We didn't go to church or anything. I said, well, I, don't, I can't tell you where he's at, but I'll tell you this. If your dad's in heaven, he's saying, I want you up here with me. But if your dad's in hell, he's saying, I don't want you down here with me. Amen. Right? Wherever he's at, he's going to encourage you one way or another. Amen? Now, there's some people we've lost. Didn't make it. Wherever they're at, they're telling you, don't come here. Amen. Don't come here. See, those in hell care about you. That's right. Those in heaven care about you because the Bible says that those that are in heaven, they're, in, they're rejoicing. Luke chapter 15. In heaven, over one sinner that repented, more than, more than 99 just persons that need no repentance. Let me tell you how, how salvation works here on earth. Now, I don't know who's rejoicing. The Bible doesn't tell us that. I've heard people say, oh, them saints in heaven or the angels in heaven. or I don't know who's rejoicing, but there's joy. I know that. Maybe they're all doing it. I don't know who's doing it, but there's rejoicing. <clears throat> Let me show you how that works. One day, I was talking to, uh, no, you guys have heard the story, but I'm going to tell it again because I like the story. Me and Sister Manhood were talking, and, and she said, Pastor Edward, that was her son, moved to Bonanza, remember? Bonanza, Oregon. He'll never be saved now. I said, what do you mean he'll never be saved? There's a little church out there, and it's just a little... No good you know, Sister Vanna. I said, what are you talking about, Sister Vanna? I said, she goes, he'll never be saved, Pastor. He's not going to get saved. Oh, I wanted to see Edward get saved so bad that she's telling me this. <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, yeah, isn't there too bad? Isn't it too bad that God only lives in Salinas? What do you mean? I said, well, evidently God only lives in Salinas to you because you don't think God's over there? Amen? I said, what you ought to be doing is praying for him. Well, I do pray for him. I said, but if you don't believe he's going to get saved, why pray for him? And we went back and forth for a little bit. Well, Pastor, I think you're right. I'll just pray that God will work a miracle or something out there. And she did, by the way. And one of the people I know that I can depend on praying for is Sister Van. Amen. And so I, uh, one day, Edward was, I think he was in the hospital. Somebody, somebody went to go see him. He was a Baptist minister. Walked in and said, well, I just didn't make any visits around the hospital. Thought I'd come by and see how you're doing. And Edward got saved. Amen. He got saved. She calls me and says, Pastor, you won't believe what happened. You won't. I said, what happened, Sister Leonard? Edward got saved. Hallelujah. Edward got saved. Oh, you mean God was over there? I'm still kidding about it. But the truth is, people, God is everywhere. Amen? Amen. Uh, we don't have to say, well, if you're here, if you're there. No, God is everywhere. And I'm going to say this to you. Uh, God cares. Amen? God God cares for those that are that are lost, and God will do everything that he can. Why? Because just as much as she was rejoicing here, there's somebody waiting for you to get saved somewhere. Amen. Maybe in hell, maybe in heaven. But somebody is waiting for you to be saved. And I, I have to hurry. I'm, I'm running out of time here. I'm going to give you my last, my last point here, or my last five points real quick, all right? Someone in heaven cares about you, and I'm going to give you this, this thought here. The church should care. Amen. Amen. The church should care. I didn't say the church cares, but the church should care. That's Amen. Right. We went to a, years ago, I was pastor of the South Union, and I dealt with this young man over and over again. He wouldn't get saved. You know, people do the dumbest things. Here's a young man had hair down to his waist. Down to his waist. 
And I said, well, I said, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to see you get saved. He said, oh, I'll get saved, but first I'm going to ask you a question. I said, what's that? He goes, are you going to ask me to cut my hair? I said, well, the Bible says men should have short hair. He said, I'm not going to get saved here. I said, well, why aren't you going to get saved here? He said, I'm not cutting my hair for you or anybody. I've made that known already. Mm -hmm. Then he got a good job, and guess what he did? Cut his hair. The city said, well, you can work for us. you got to cut your hair. And I told him, I said, you cut your hair for the city, but not for the Lord. Amen. You get saved and go to heaven. Well, I don't have to cut my hair to get saved. I, said, I didn't say you have to cut your hair to get saved, but I'm saying to you, that, that was your main concern. And when the city hires you, immediately you cut your hair without any problem. Well, he never would get saved. I tried everything I could. He would never would get saved. And then one day they found him dead. Had been shot. And I remember it bothered me quite a bit that I couldn't get him saved. That I couldn't do the best I could to get him saved. And as I, as I thought about that young man, I said to, uh, to another guy that went to our church, I said, you know, so-and-so, boy, I'll tell you what, man, he, he died, man. They shot him. He got killed. Man, I couldn't make, get him to make a profession. He looked at me and goes, well, that's what he gets for it. I said, no. That's the wrong attitude. Amen. That's the wrong attitude. Because if that's what he gets, that's what we all deserve. Amen. Right? Amen. If we all got what we deserve, we go to hell. But God in his love saved us. Amen. Amen? Amen. I'm just simply saying the church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ should care. Amen. Where you're going. We ought to be the kind of church that says, you know what, I care what happens to so-and-so. I care if they go to heaven or hell. Oh, but he was a mean man. Yep, yeah, but I guarantee you had children that loved him. That's right. He had a wife that cared about him. Amen? Amen. Right. And when you get to the point that you don't care for people, you need to get your heart right with God. That's Something's right. wrong. Something's wrong in your heart when you don't care for people. Amen? What if your loved one went to a church well, they didn't care what happened to him. Your son or your daughter passed away, and you said, Pastor, my daughter, well, that's what she deserves. Mm -hmm. How would you feel? Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. We have to care for people. Amen. Because somebody loves them. And for sure, God loves them. Amen. We have to care for people. Let's all stand. Our fathers, we come in prayer. First of all, Lord, perhaps there's someone here that says, sometimes I feel like no one cares. But Father, may we be able to say to them, yeah, God cares. The Lord cares what happens to you. The Lord cares about your life. The Lord cares what's going on in your home. It could be there's someone here that says, no man cares for my soul. Yet, yet, yet Jesus cares for your soul. Amen. May they come to the altar and say, Lord, thank you for caring about me. Thank you for dealing with me and not letting me go when things got rough. Thank you for keeping your hand on me. And Heavenly Father, thank you for saving me. And maybe someone's here that day says, I need to be saved. I need to give my life to Jesus. As our heads are bowed, Father, we pray that 